Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 12066 Land Law. This is week eight. And tonight we continue our discussion on retail shop leases. I'm well aware that I haven't yet covered the material in relation to perpetuities, but we will return to that after this topic. In order to make, make the most of this topic, those that have joined me live, and thank you very much all for doing so, those that are watching this as a recorded session, I'll ask you to please have on your screen the Retail Shop Leases Act. You can either go through Osley or Legislation Queensland for that. And I will ask you to also reference the Retail Shop Leases Regulation 2016, both Queensland, of course. You'll need to access the, leg the regulation through Legislation Queensland. But primarily, and to start with, it's the Act. Um, just as a a quick note, retail shop lease disputes are referred to the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, QCAT. And if a landlord or a tenant are unable to resolve the dispute about a retail shop lease, then either party lodges a notice of dispute with QCAT. So when we're talking about commercial leases other than retail shop leases, the matters are um, litigated in magistrates, district and Supreme Court. Um, for re retail shop lease matters primarily, but not entirely, in QCAT. Let's have a look at the object. Section 3 of the Act says that the object is to promote efficiency and equity in the conduct of certain retail businesses in Queensland, not all of them, but certain re businesses. Section 4 says the object is achieved by mandatory minimum standards for retail shop leases and low cost dispute resolution process for retail tenancy disputes. To me, I've always thought this is quite arbitrary and I raised the example last week of a butcher having the benefit as a tenant of these provisions and a panel beater, for example, not having the benefit of these provisions. But it all comes back to the perceived concerns about tenants being in an unfair advantage for negotiation and um, resolution of disputes in commercial shopping centres. That's where it all started. Now, the minimum standards um, include minimum lease standards. They're set out in Part 6, Division 4, which deals with rent review, including Sections 27 and 36. And that's something I extracted from the relevant explanatory notes and the second reading speech. So for assessment work, for example, it's always good value to include something of an extract from the legislation, definitely, but also explanatory notes, second reading speeches, case law, and then as a final alternative, academic writing, including the textbook. I do see a lot of assessment work, which is around the other way. And a lot of the, I think the lesser papers, extract material from textbooks first, and in doing so, seem to forget about the legislation. But those of you that have worked with me in the past, you know that I like you to refer to the primary sources of the law at first instance. And certainly that's the way I operate and I encourage you to do it. It's not to say you don't read textbooks, you don't read articles, you do, but um, you first look at the legislation. And that's the way that your responses should reflect your answer. Now, <clears throat> you would think that it's pretty simple to say that this act applies to retail shop leases and we can just move on. But we need to take a moment to think about what is a retail shop lease. So I've prepared a little overview. I'm going to go through it step by step and I'd ask you to try and follow this. Don't worry too much about the act while we do this, but we'll go back and have a look at the act um, in conjunction with this in a little more detail. So number one, the Retail Shop Leases Act applies to all retail shop leases. Nothing magical there. So you've got that. Number two, what's a retail shop lease? Well, you'd think it would be a lease of a retail shop, but it's not, not quite. It's most leases of a retail shop. So what's a retail shop? A retail shop can be one of two things either premises that are situated within a retail shopping centre or premises that are wholly or predominantly used for carrying on a retail business. 
Well, at least in both instances, most and most, there are exceptions. So when you're talking about, when you're thinking about what's a retail shop lease, think of a business or, um, a pre that's within a retail shopping centre or something that is wholly or predominantly used for carrying on a retail business. What that means is that by implication, you may have a circumstance where something which is other than carrying on a retail business might be covered by the Retail Shop Leases Act because it happens to be within a retail shopping centre. Does that make sense? So lawyers and accountants, if they set up their practice within a retail shopping centre, they might, on the face of it, become a retail shop. Whereas if they had their practice operating from a high-rise building, a commercial building, they're not covered. So it's not entirely clear and you need to look at the circumstances. What's a retail shopping centre? Well, you think of a retail shopping centre as something like Indrapilly or Toomble or something, Chermside. Um, I don't know the names of the shopping centres elsewhere. Um, so that's what we think of. But a retail shopping centre is actually a cluster of premises which require five or more premises used wholly or predominantly used for carrying on retail business. So small centres can be covered by this. But <clears throat> there are other attributes, common ownership, common buildings, and it has to be a cluster of premises promoted or generally regarded as a shopping centre or mall or shopping arcade. So there has to be that commonality and the fact that it's regarded or promoted as a shopping centre. So then it, gets, it starts to get a bit grey around the edges, doesn't it? So the next thing is, what's a retail business? A retail business is that which is prescribed by regulation as a retail business. Again, we're talking most, because there are the exceptions. Remember, this is just an overview, so don't worry, we'll, look, we'll fill in the detail later. So that's number five. So um, number six is, is a retail shop lease excluded? And there are some. We'll look at section 5A. In essence, big shops are excluded. They weren't previously, but subject to the amendments more recently, any shop, retail shop with a floor area of more than a thousand square metres is excluded. The rationale being, if you're big enough to have a store, a retail shop with floor area of more than a thousand square metres, you don't need the protection. You've got your own bargaining position, your own bargaining power. So John, just yes. Yes, with Karen. regard to that, um, so say, for instance, we'd be talking about something like Big W or Myers or one of those sorts of things. So for the purposes of the definition of a retail shopping centre, would that still count as being one of the five or more of the premises? Oh, that's a really good question. That's a really good question, and I don't off the hand, off the cuff, know the answer to that. Does anyone have an answer? Has anyone done some research that can answer that one? I hadn't thought about that, Karen, because it never used to be an exception. We might have to. I'll have to look at that one. Sorry, I'm tempted to say yes, it is, but then logically, if it's not a retail shop, how can it be considered? within the context of a retail shopping centre. Good point though, good point. My inclination is yes, but we might just have to look into that one. Um, thank you, Karen, appreciate that. What else is excluded? Well, some retail shops in South Bank, um, theme or amusement parks, they're excluded. Premises at a flea market, temporary retail stalls, premises within a common area of a retail shopping centre, you know, like an ATM or a vending machine. They're not retail shops. Also excluded, and this is 5A3, a lease of premises within a retail shopping centre if the premises uh, are not wholly or predominantly used for carrying on a retail business and they're within a special part of the centre um, which is low retail occupancy. So, for example, if you've got a multi-level building, a retail area needs to have 25, it needs to be at least 25% retail area um, in order for that to qualify as being a retail shopping centre. So these are the exceptions in section 5A.
That's just the overview, one to six. Let's just flesh that out a bit. Have a look at section 5A. It deals with the meaning of a retail shop lease. It talks about a retail shop lease being a lease of a retail shop. However, subsection two, it doesn't include A to G. And then look at subsection three, which says a retail shop lease does not include those premises which are you know, in part of multi-level premises, etc. The best thing to do is look at the example for this, the last part. And it says, here's the examples. A lease of a premises for an accounting practice on level four of a retail shopping centre is not a retail shop lease if at the time the lease was entered into, 75% of the total little area of level four was used prim primarily for professional or commercial offices. Does that make sense? So that's an example of one exception. And the second is, so by implication, if that same account accountancy practice was on the ground level and we had a situation where most of the shops on that ground level were retail shops, then it would be that accountancy practice would be a retail shopping lease um, premises. Excuse me, John. Yes, Monique. Um, the wording of that clause where it says um, at the time the lease was entered into, is that still only applicable from the effective date of the amendments or does that then rope in the actual date the lease was entered into? Again, that's a very good question. Um, my view is that it is as at the date that the lease was entered into because we'll come to a provision um, that talks about the effect of this um, Retail Shop Lease Act now, but I'm open to contrary views on that because um, I find this tricky. Yes. So Ms. I'm just Karen? having a look at the dictionary in the back of the Act and as part of the amendments in 2016, it says entered into for an assignment of a lease means the lessor has consented to the assignment. So. No, that's yeah, good. Much, I'm not sure that takes it much further. But no, that's good. Monique, did you have a view on this? Um, well, I did read the clause that you're referring to that talks about how those amendments affect certain existing clauses. And the conclusion that I came to was um, that generally the shops that perhaps would have been considered a retail shop lease prior to the amendments would not actually have been affected significantly by the amendments. And so I didn't quite get to determining the question that I just asked you. Yeah, no, sorry. And look, um, what we might do is revisit that when we get to the section sure. so we can look at that again. Because yep. the general, I mean, the general law is, the general rule is that it's not retrospective. So generally speaking, I'm sorry, and this is probably contradicting what I earlier said, but generally speaking, we look at the law as it was at the time as having the effect um, in relation to a particular thing. So let's just march on and we'll see if the answers come, become apparent. So we know that there are exceptions. We know that a shop that is not actually used as a retail shop may in fact be covered by the Retail Shop Lease Leasing Act um, because of where it's situated, which is within a shopping centre. Well, there's definitions of retail area, definitions of total level area in section 5A. Now 5B, it talks about the meaning of a retail shop. And again, it's either situated in a retail shopping centre or it's predominantly used as a retail business. So what's a retail business? Section 5C, that which is prescribed by regulation. Now here's where we need to look at the regulation. The Retail Shop Leases Regulation 2016, in particular, look at Schedule 1, which is um, referred to in Section 8 of the regulations. If you've got the regulation in front of you, you'll need to look at page 16. Now, I might see if I can successfully share the screen 
to find the regulation. And if you can just bear with me while I do that. Okay, this should be it. So can you see schedule one on the screen if you just nod if that's what you see? All right. Now to get an idea of how extensive this legislation is, how wide reaching it is, we look at the schedule and bear in mind that by definition, irrespective of whether these premises are within a shopping centre or not, they are going to be covered by the Retail Shop Lease Act unless they fit within an exception, which is if they're more than a thousand square metres or at South Bank and a few other things. So just have a look at how many different shops and businesses are covered by the Retail Shop Lease Act. And you can see why when we talk about the general law of leasing and the involvement of the Magistrates Court, the District Court and the Supreme Court, that that excludes all of these things that are covered by the Retail Shop Leases Act, which are dealt with in an entirely different manner, both in terms of regulation and dispute resolution. So I hope I'm not moving too quickly, but you get an idea of how wide reaching these different businesses are. And I hope that my internet is strong enough to be um, showing this clearly enough. And it just, the list just goes on and on. So what you need to do then is ensure that if you're involved in a leasing dispute, that you don't immediately go straight to the Property Law Act and provide an answer on that legislation because you need to determine whether it's a retail shop lease that you're dealing with. And that means have a look looking at section five with all its different variations. Now down to 5D, which is the meaning of a retail shopping centre. A retail shopping centre means a cluster of premises having all the attributes, five or more premises, with it carrying on a retail business, um, all owned by the one person, having this recognition or promotion of being a retail shopping centre. So I won't go through that section in any more detail just for the moment, but what I do want you to do is practice, and you do this in the second assessment, working out whether in fact a particular premises is a retail shop lease covered by the Act or not. Now the balance of the Act, uh, the Retail Shop Leases Act, part four deals with the operation of the Act and former Act, sections 10 and 1020C. Now that might be the source of some of the answers to the questions that have been we've been discussing tonight, because it talks about the operation of the Act and the former Act. So let's just have a look at that briefly. And I'll share the screen to um, look at that part in terms of a bit more detail. Won't be a moment. Monique, Karen, have you looked at these sections? Yep. Okay, good. Looking now. All right. So you can see there the operation of the Act and the former Act. So Monique, just coming back to your question, hopefully this um, will provide some answers. Was there, um, you were talking about a retail shop lease at the time, prior to the introduction of the amendments. Is that correct? Yes. Um, oh. I was just after the specific wording of, um, yeah, when lease entered into, that's right, yep. So these provisions explain it. Thanks. All right. Well, I guess they do. So let's have a look at section 12 first. So if you've got legislation on your desktop, have a look at it. So operation of the Act, um, this Act, meaning as it is now, applies to all retail shop leases, regardless of where the lease was entered into, uh, that's a premises of Queensland, even though it purports to be governed by law. So that deals with jurisdiction in a physical sense rather than a temporal sense. Section 13, application of Act to leases generally. The Act applies to all retail shop leases, whether entered into or renewed before or after the 28th of October, 1994, subject to various provisions. And section 19 deals with the application of the Act and former Act to former leases um, is one. And section 14, deals with premises that become or cease to be a retail shop lease 
after commencement of the lease. So there may be some clues in that one, in those sections. Section 15 deals with the provisions implied in leases. Section 16, contracting out. And then we get on to part five. So at this stage, my view is that we consider the law that applied at the time that the lease was entered into, but we acknowledge by reference to section um, 13 of the Act, that this Act now applies to disputes that are current in relation to those matters. So if we determine, for example, that it is a retail shop lease, um, because that it was at the time a retail shop lease, it's still covered by this legislation. But for example, the dispute resolution procedures or other issues um, relate to the law as it is now. So have a look at the old legislation to determine the threshold question. But once you've decided it's a retail shop lease, look at the law as it is now. And the reference to that would be section 13. I hope that makes it reasonably clear. Yes, Monique? It does. Thanks, John. So um, I think you just um, answered my question in your last um, sentence there. So if you have something that previously met the requirements and continues to meet the requirements, do you need to then refer to the previous Act or Section 13, or can you just focus on the current provisions? You can just focus on the current provisions. Okay, thank provided you. you. Provided you've been through that process that you described. So, thank you. Yep. All right, so um, contracting out is prohibited, which is Section 16. And then we move to Part 5, which deals with preliminary disclosures. In practice, part five is very important. So if you're acting for a landlord or a tenant, um, there are certain disclosure obligations. I'm not going to deal with those now. It's not accessible as part of this unit, but be aware of it and be aware that in practice, they're really important. Part six deals with minimum lease standards. That's sections 24 through 50B, and it deals with rent reviews. Note the requirement to engage a specialist retail shop, uh, a specialist retail valuer in terms of determining the value where it's a review to market. Division seven of part six deals with implied provisions for compensation and division eight A, provisions about unconscionable conduct refer to sections 46AB to 46B. Now I will go back and look at some specifics out of those parts, starting with section 27, which is the timing and basis of rent reviews. Subsection one, if a retail shop lease provides for a review of the rent during the term of the lease or under any option to renew the lease, it must state the timing of the review and the basis upon which the review is to be made. Typically, it will say something like the rent for the first year of the extended term will be a review to market. Subsection four says that the rent may be reviewed using different bases, but each review must be made using only one base basis. In other words, you can have a rent which is increased by CPI year by year until you get to the rent review and then you've got a different mechanism, but only one mechanism each year. I hope that makes sense. And subsection five talks about the different types of single basis upon which the rent might be reviewed. Current rent, reference to CPI, fixed percentage, an actual fixed amount, etc. But only one of those per year should apply. Now for a case that was interesting prior to the amendments in 2011, there's a decision of Connor Hunter, which is a law firm, against Keen Crest, Proprietary Limited, 2009 Queensland Court of Appeal 156. This was to do with the Courthouse Restaurant at Cleveland, which is a lovely, lovely restaurant. I'm not sure if anyone's been there, but it's really nice. Um, I used to practice down there at Cleveland, Capalaba. Um, it's a decision of the Court of Appeal. It went 2-1. Uh, Chief Justice Holmes at 34 said, I respectfully agree with Chesterman J.A. that the Retail Shop Lease Act 1994 
evinces no intention to render void clauses in a lease which permit increases but not decreases. The case was Connor, C-O-N-N-O-R Hunter, which is a, a firm, against Keencrest, PTY LTD, 2009, QCA 156. So as a result of that case, the law changed in 2011 to say, no, just one basis. So with the introduction of section 36A, um, it says that ratchet rent provisions are now void. You need to be very careful with your diction when you start talking about ratchet rent provisions, if you understand what I mean. Um, what, what that means is, and it was very typical, um, the lease could never go back in terms of the amount, it could only go up. So now that's void. Have a look at section 27A, which provides that the lessee may require early determination of current market rent. And it says that if the um, lease provides for an option of the lessee to extend or renew at a current market rent, then if there's no agreement as to what that might be, the tenant can provide an early determination period notice in order to work out that rent. And the rationale behind that is, unlike the usual position in commercial leases, where the tenant has to commit by exercising the option and find out the price later, the idea is that there's a mechanism here where the tenant can find out the price and then uh, determine whether to proceed or not. Section 28 provides for rent review on the basis of current market rent. And it says the section applies if <clears throat> the rent under a retail shop lease is reviewed on the basis of current market rental, if the lessor and the lessee cannot agree within one month of the review date, then the market rate, the market rent, is to be determined by a specialist retail valuer. And the important thing is there, it has to be a specialist retail valuer. Have a look at a case of Amrikana, Amrikama, A-M-R-I-C-A-M-A, PDYLTD against Red Carpet Real Estate, Red Carpet Real Estate, 2004 QSC 267. Here's what happened in that case. Amrikama is the tenant. Red Carpet, the lessor, the, the landlord. The lease provided for the parties to agree on the market rent for the first year of the extended term. If not, an expert, being a valuer, would determine the rental. Now, on the 12th of June 2013, Amrikata wrote to Red Carpet requesting an early determination for a fair market rental under the terms and conditions of the lease. And um, in the letter it said, this will enable us to do decide on rent affordability and viability before we exercise our option to renew for a further term. So in that case, the tenant was seeking to take advantage of the provision, which is not available for the panel beta that I mentioned before, only for retail shop leases. The parties disagreed about the rent to be paid. Amrikana filed a notice of dispute in QCAT, seeking early determination of the rent. QCAT organized a mediation, which is typically what happens. At the mediation, the parties agreed on a valuer, Mr. Smith, who was not a specialist retail valuer. Mr. Smith furnished a report. Four days later, Amrikana exercised the option. Yes, we're happy with that. It works within our business model. We now have certainty. We know the figure. We exercise the option. A month later, the lawyers for Red Carpet said, we have our client's instructions. We are in the process of preparing the documentation. Right, everything's going along as per plan. Two months later, those same lawyers write back and say, we've realised that the valuer was not a specialist retail valuer, despite the fact that the parties agreed at mediation to appoint that person, we now dispute the amount and we refuse to provide you with a lease. So what would you do if you were Amrikama's lawyer in those circumstances? You'd seek a declaration of the tribunal 
that it had validly exercised its option to renew, that the rent payable for the first year of the term was as per the valuation, the valuation was determined as per the original agreement. In this case, it was $160,000 plus outgoings plus GST. And that red carpet deliver a lease in registrable form, in other words, a mandatory injunction through the tribunal. The issues before the tribunal were in relation to section 27A, um, and this, this matter then went to the uh, full court or to the Supreme Court. Section 27A, allows for determination of market rent before the option. We know that. 27A provides for it to be determined by a retail specialist, specialist retail valuer. Question is, does 27A of the Act apply? Can the parties waive the provisions of 27A? The court held that the lease did not provide for the rent to be determined in a, uh, sorry, did not provide for it to be determined in a particular way, but the Act did apply the current market rent had to be determined by a retail specialist valuer. Mr. Smith wasn't, therefore his valuation was not determinative of the current market rental. In other words, the parties could not agree to extract themselves from the terms of the Act. Bearing in mind that this Act is stated to be one where the parties cannot contract out of it. Did I mention that? Was it section 16, contracting out of the Act is prohibited? The idea of that, I'm sure, when Parliament made the Act, was to protect tenants. In other words, we're putting in these minimum standards with the idea of reining in the landlords, so therefore you can't contract out of it. But in my view, this is a case where the tenant was adversely disadvantaged, in probably in a circumstance where Parliament didn't intend it. Anyway, the tenant lost, and um, uh, the court said that the conclusion was inescapable. Um, the respondent cannot be stopped, cannot be said to have waived its rights under the Act. And for this reason, the assessment by Mr. Smith did not accord with the requirements of the Act, and it's a void of no effect. So that left the parties in a terrible situation. Um, much like the NES and the Fair Work Act, says Monique. Now, Division 4 deals with rent reviews. The timing and the basis of rent reviews, I've mentioned that briefly. I'll just refer you to section 39, which talks about the payment of key money. And 39 says that a person may not, as a lessor or for the lessor, under or in relation to a retail shop lease, seek or accept a payment of key money for any amount for the goodwill of the lessee's business within the shop. And in fact, there's a penalty provision, 100 penalty units. Compensation, which is Division 7 of the Act, provides for implied provisions for compensation. Have a look at Section 41A, where it talks about a lessee being an assignee, including an assignee. Key money is where the landlord says something like, I will allow you to move into this premises if you pay me money. There's nothing wrong with it going the other way. The lessor can say, I will pay you a rent incentive or an incentive to come in, but you can't accept money as a lump sum. Um, it, it's a bit like, if I can use the term, it's a bit like scalping. You can't scalp, so the lessors can't ask for a lump sum payment in order to get the money in. And you can understand circumstances where this may have happened. Say, for example, you have a business worth a million dollars as a going concern within that lease. You try to sell the business and you ask for the landlord's consent. The landlord says, I'll consent provided the person coming in pays me $20,000 because, you know, you're, you're getting a million out of it. So it's fair enough that I get 20,000. Um, so that's an example of key money. Now, compensation, have a look at section 42 where a retail shop lease is taken to include sections 43, 43AA, 43AB, AC, AD, 43A and 44. So we'll just have a look at some of those sections. Section 43, when compensation is payable by a lessor for business disturbance. A lessor 
is liable to pay the lessee reasonable compensation for loss or damage suffered by the lessee because the lessor or someone acting under the lessor's authority does something, substantially restricts the lessee's access to a shop. So if the lessor puts up a barricade and it stops people being able to walk into Subway, then the owner of that lease can sue for the damage that it's caused or seek for compensation. Um, other things, acts if the landlord acts in a way that substantially restricts or alters access by customers to the shop or the flow of potential customers past the shop or causes significant disruption to the trading in the shop um, and does not rectify this as soon as possible, then compensation provisions apply. Let's have a look at a case. This dealt with compensation for obstruction. So bear in mind, you've got the section, so you need to refer to that. Um, the case is Susanna and John, PTY LTD, against Trident Ashgrove, JV, PTY LTD. It's case number two, and it was 2011, QCATA, which is the appeal jurisdiction of QCAT, 260. I take it you all know where, how to find the QCAT cases in the Supreme Court Library, amongst other things. Now the applicant, Susanna and John, leased a shop from the respondent from Trident. And Susanna and John claimed that Trident constructed a coffee shop in a kiosk near its business, and that compromised its visibility, it compromised um, access by customers, it altered the flow of potential customers past the shop and the respondent's action in offering a new lease constituted unconscionable conduct. So it was relying on the statutory provisions and also saying it's unconscionable. The president of the tribunal at the time, um, the president of QCAT is always a Supreme Court judge. At that time it was Justice Alan Wilson. At 16 his honour said as the tribunal also observed, there are other possible exceptions, explanations for a decline in the tenant's turnover uh, from its business. Therefore, S&J failed to establish anything that would attract a right of compensation under section 43. That explanation includes an analysis of the location layout of the shop nearby premises. So the reason I refer that case to you is um, to show that just because there's a decline, doesn't mean there'll be automatic compensation. The tenants still need to establish the causal situation between it and the actions of the landlord. Another QCAT decision is, I'm not sure I can spell this, um, say it, I'll spell it. C-H-R-I-S-T-O-D-O-U-L-O-U. Christolulu, Christodulu and Nobolo against ISPT, PTYLTD, 2013 QCAT 206. Now, this case was involving the Winter Garden Shopping Centre in Brisbane CBD. There was a major redevelopment. The tenants, Ms C and Mr N, Nobolo, operated a retail shop trading essentials, gift and homeware in the Winter Garden Centre. Throughout the period leading up to and including the, the redevelopment in 2010, tenancies, key tenancies were leaving when their leases concluded, tenant mix changed, areas were hoarded off and, and um, works were done, two kiosks were constructed, uh, so there were real problems, disruptions through air conditioning, car parks, etc. And the retail shop lease claim for compensation was dealt with by the tribunal and basically the tribunal said, when we look at section 43 of the act, we look at all the circumstances, we're of the view that the landlord did breach its obligations and in that case, the tribunal awarded the applicants compensation in the sum of $186,503. Have a look at section 43AA, 
which talks about when compensation is payable by the lessor for false or misleading statements. The lessor is liable to the lessee for reasonable compensation for um, damage suffered by the lessee because the lessee entered into the lease or a renewal or assignment based on false or misleading statements or representations by the lessor or someone with their authority or the lease shop was not available for trading um, when required under the disclosure obligations. Have a look at section 44 which talks about the amount of compensation. So if the parties can't agree on the amount of compensation, this section is the one to refer to for working out the amount. Again, another case, ORSAY, O-R-S-A-Y, Holdings, PTYLTD, against Chaz Straker, PTYLTD, as trustee for the Diane Cray Family Trust. Again, a QCAT appeal case, 2012 QCATA 264. The lessor operated a marine a marina complex at the Urangan Boat Harbour at Harvey Bay. So my hometown. The lessees, uh, the leases um, were various parts of the marina to different lessees. There were a few shops and food establishments. There was a mooring for a vessel in the harbour. It was the Spirit One, one of the whale watching boats, very, very large boat. But when moored in front, the boat was about twice as long as the frontage of the leased premises, which was a restaurant. And this restaurant was on the first level of this shopping complex. Um, the only view, the, the boat was so high that from the restaurant on the first floor, the only view was above to the sky. Um, the tenant complained about the docking and departure of the boat, caused noise, disruption, and the painting of the boat over a week produced noxious sort of fumes, put people off the restaurant. And at 42, the tribunal, the appeal tribunal said, it is often said that there is no right to a view. Generally, that's true. But it is not true when it comes to a landlord who derogates from a grant and offends the provisions of the Retail Shop Lease Act and causes significant disruption to the lessee's trading. And at 44, after working out various computations, the applicants are entitled to the sum of $100,238 for compensation as a result of breaching Section 43 of the Retail Shop Leases Act. Section 44A talks about limitation on compensation amount. 46 talks about lessor's notice when an option to renew or extend must be exercised. Sorry, John, can I just yes, ask Kathleen? a question? Yeah, sure. Um, sorry, I've just been thinking, I was probably back a little bit, but um, when you talk about um, the access and disruption of access and you talk about other shops um, disrupting access, would they have to come after the lease of the original shop? Like if you're saying that a particular shop is disrupting access, um, if you saw that when you went into the lease, is that going to affect your claim? So, yeah, would it have I, to be? Yeah, I think it would. I think if you knew what the circumstances were going into it, um, that is likely to affect the situation. And whilst you might succeed, in reality, you may not um, recover any funds. But it depends on the degree and um, the extent. Uh, and the, the timing is also relevant as well. So I think that would be a good defence, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, so section 46 talks about the option to renew when it must be exercised. And it says that it applies to a retail shop lease. And it says at least two months, but no longer than six months before the option date, the lessor must give a notice about the option. And the option date for a retail shop lease means the date under which the lease must be exercised. You don't get that in a normal commercial lease. There's no obligation on the landlord to remind but there is in a retail shop lease. Again, let's look at a case. This is Nguyen, 
against Nguyen. That's N-G-U-Y-E-N against N-G-U-Y-E-N and another. 2013 QCAT 315. This was to do with a Vietnamese restaurant at West End in Brisbane. The lease commenced in 2009. It expired 2012. It contained options to renew, two lots of three-year options. We call it three by three by three lease. The lease required the tenant to give the landlord's written notice at least six months before the end of the lease. Um, in other words, the lease was to finish on the 6th of April 2012, which meant that the tenant was obliged to give notice of intent to exercise by the 6th of October 2011. That's under the terms of the lease. It's pretty common, that type of provision. The tenant failed to give the notice, and on February 2012, by the solicitors, the tenant purported to exercise the option as from the 6th of April. So they didn't give the notice in time, but they eventually gave notice, but two months, less than two months before the lease was up. On the 21st of February, four days after the purported notice, the landlord rejected the offer and said, no, we want you out by the 6th of April, 2012. The matter came before the tribunal. The tenant's arguments were, uh, and that what they sought was a declaration from the tribunal that the landlords had waived or were at least equitably stopped from relying on clause 22 of the lease, that she was entitled to renew her tenancy as from the 6th of April, 2012. The tenant admitted not exercising the option within time, but said that um, there's a waiver and promissory estoppel and also argued section 46 of the act means that because the landlord failed to give the notice, then time is no longer of the essence. So the issues in that case were, are the provisions regarding the timing waived? Is the lessor um, not entitled to rely on the strict time limits? Have a look at the decision at paragraph 28. It says, failure to comply with section 46 renders the landlord liable to the maximum penal sanction of 40 penalty units. But the section has no adverse consequences otherwise prescribed. Elsewhere, by comparison and contrast, the Retail Shop Lease Act imposes clear civil law consequences for non-compliance with the provisions. It is reasonable to infer that if legislation intended Section 46 to sanction something other than a fine, it would have expressly said so. And at 29, promissory estoppel may arise when a party to an agreement indicates in sufficiently clear terms that he will not insist on strict compliance with a term that exists for his benefit. That wasn't apparent in this case. So even though the, the provision seems to have been inserted as an attempt to protect tenants, because the legislature included the penalty provision, it was held effectively to be that a failure to comply renders liable the landlord to a penalty, but doesn't actually confer on the tenant any real substantial benefit. So that's a case that would be disappointing for the tenants. Have a look at section 46AA, which talks about renewing a lease if there is no option or other agreement. Now, again, this is only in a retail shop lease. So if we have a retail shop lease and there's no option on the lessee's part to renew, the lessor must, by written notice, offer the lessee a renewal or tell the lessee that the lessor is not going to offer a renewal. So the, le the section doesn't force a landlord to offer a renewal, but what it does, the intention is to make it very clear to the tenant, look, you either have an option and if so, please accept it, or I'm letting you know that you're not going to have an option so you can do some planning. And it provides for notice periods. So the notice periods are quite generous. If the lease is not more than a year, it has to be at least three months. But at the lease, if the lease is more than one year, it has to be at least six months, um, but no longer than one year before the lease ends.
I know I've been doing a lot of talking. You're very patient. You're doing well. Um, we have no gentleman joining us tonight. Isn't that Excuse terrible? Me, yes, Yomi. Yes, Yomi. Um, with section 46 AA, does that mean um, the landlord is not compelled, can decide if they want, if he wants to renew the contract, the agreement lease or not? Or does that mean it could do one or either? No, basically, it, it now bear in mind it only applies in a lease where there is no option. What it does is it forces the landlord to make a call and make a declaration. So if there's no option in the lease, the landlord has a choice. They can offer an option to the tenant or they can say to the tenant, look, I'm not offering you an option. But the obligation is to tell the tenant one way or the other well in advance so the tenant has plenty of time to prepare. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. All right, so then have a look at, yes, uh, yes, have a look at sections 46AB, 46B, which deal with unconscionable conduct. Section 46AB says the division applies to retail shop leases entered into or after 24 June 2001. So that's an example of what we were talking about earlier in our discussion with Monique and Karen about the extent to which this act might apply to some degree retrospectively. Section 46A talks about unconscionable conduct and it says that a lessor must not, in connection to a retail shop lease, act unconscionably. Same applies to a lessee. So this one, it reverses, it's both. Lessee, lessor, lessee. Um, now section 46B, matters that QCAT may, con may consider in deciding if a party is acting unconscionably. So if you're going to mount some form of argument regarding unconscionability within the context of a retail shop lease dispute, you really do need to refer to section 46B and give some consideration to the provisions that are outlined in that section. I won't go through it in full, but if you like, it serves as a very useful checklist. Um, if nothing more, in terms of um, what you might argue. I will give you, however, a case. Now, this is Belmed, B-E-L-M-E-D, PTYLTD, trading as Belmont Medical Centre against Nichols Construction, PTYLTD, 2013 QCAT 158. Belmed, B-E-L-M-E-D. Now, in this case, Belmed was the tenant trading as Belmont Medical Centre. So it was a medical centre. And at least premises from Nickel Construction. Leading up to the end of the lease, Belmed sought an extension of the lease for further two months. See, what had happened is that Belmed was in the process of building its own premises. It needed an extra two months. The parties agreed on a two-month extension of the lease, but on conditions that Belmed pay two months worth of rent and outgoings. Well, that's fair enough. That Belmed would leave its plant and equipment, you know, the, the fit out, the remain. Well, maybe that's fair enough because Belmed would have to go to the expense of removing it and stripping it all back. So why do that when it's perfectly good? Fair enough. That was the second condition. Third condition, that Belmed pay an extra $20,000 over and above. Hmm. This went to the tribunal. Both parties were represented by solicitors and barristers, which again, just another point in the tribunal, even though it says, you know, it's designed for self-represented parties. I think I've mentioned this before. Regularly, we see solicitors and barristers. So if you want to practice in this area, don't be afraid to put your hand up um, because you, you, you can still get lots of work in it. Anyway, the applicant said this, a Belmont filed a notice of dispute and it sought orders um, by way of declaration that the payment of $20,000 constitutes key money, prohibit section 39 of the Act, and that Nichols was behaving unconscionably and that Nichols should refund not only the $20,000 but also the value of the fit out 
the value of the equipment. Um, so therefore a total of $39,000. The tribunal at 57 said, the tribunal agrees that the standard and degree of proof is one that um, must be presented by way of proper evidence. So again, there's another little misconception that the tribunal doesn't, isn't evidence-based. It certainly is evidence-based. And it's up to the party that brings the application to prove its case. Just the ordinary same old principles. 57, that was 57. 58, the fit out, which was left, would have assisted by reletting. Um, it would have made the premises much easier to let out. In fact, that's what happened. Another medical practice said, well, we're going to go in there. So they went in. But both parties derived a benefit because Belmer didn't have to make good the provisions that saved them a lot of cost. So in the end, uh, the tribunal at 62 made the following orders. The payment of $20,000 was key money. It was prohibited. Nichols did behave unconscionably. And within 28 days, Nichols was to repay $20,000. But the claim for other compensation for the fit out was dismissed. No order as to costs. That's the other thing. You can get costs orders in the tribunal. All right, any questions about that case or unconscionability? Um, very quickly, section 50A talks about the release of an assignor and guarantor from a lease. You'll recall if it's a non-retail shop lease, if you transfer your business, then potentially you can still be liable to the landlord. That doesn't apply for a retail shop lease. Have a look at section 50A. So have a look at section 83, which talks about QCAT orders. And it gives you an idea of the type of orders that might be made by the tribunal. And subsection two says without limiting subsection one. So subsection one says QCAT can make orders, including declaratory orders, that QCAT considers to be just to resolve a retail tenancy dispute. Without limiting subsection one, subsection two says that QCAT may make one or follow more of the following orders. A, an order for the parties to a dispute to do or not to do anything, to pay an amount, uh, an order that a party is not to required to pay an amount, etc. Section 94 deals with jurisdiction and it says, um, once we have a lodgement of a dispute notice for a retail tenancy dispute, the dispute must not be referred to arbitration or heard by a court, but that section, subsection one, does not apply if the notice of dispute is withdrawn, proceedings were started in the court before the dispute notice was lodged, and a party applied for an injunction through a court, um, or a mediator um, refuses to deal with the matter. There's also Excuse section one two four. Yes, Manny. Sorry, John. Um, so if there were, if there was, say, a matter being dealt with by QCAT, but other issues that were more appropriate to be brought before a court, can the two separate proceedings run, or do they need to be assigned to the one forum? It's messy, and I would think in practice there'd be an application for matters to be um, transferred to the most suitable jurisdiction, whatever that would be. So theoretically, okay. it could happen. But in practice, I don't think that um, that would happen indeed. All right, so good question. Thank you. All right, so that's all, um, all I propose to talk about for retail shop leases. I do hope that has helped in some way for your assessment piece. Next week, we're not going to deal with social housing we're going to return to perpetuities, which I think was week six material. And from then we'll go to social housing after that. Um, I can indicate that there won't be any um, assessment on social housing. That's an area uh, of expertise for um, Dr. Nankaro. So I'll leave that um, for uh, Dr. Nankaro um, and I'm just filling in for him this term. All right, so any questions about what we've done tonight? All good? John, All I have a very quick question. Yes, Emma. Just regarding section 20A of the Act, it talks about short-term retail leases um, being less than six months. So does that override the Land Titles Act 
of short-term lease definitions? I think they're for different purposes. Um, the answer is no, it won't override it. So, but for the purposes of a retail shop lease act, um, it would apply, but only within the context of this act, not, not so beyond that. If you had a two year lease that came under a retail shop lease, would it? Um, it's still, still, be a, retail lease, it, so it's still a retail shop leases act. Yes. It's still covered by the act. But so, it's not a short term lease. Is that correct? No, um, it is a short term lease. If you were looking at it within the context of anything to do with the property law act uh, or the land titles act, for example. So that section in the retail shop leases act would limit it only to matters pertaining to that act but in the broader scheme of things property law act land title act it's still a short-term lease i hope that makes sense yeah i was just a little bit confused as to whether the two of them work together or whether you have to go with one act if that makes sense yeah you'd think there'd be some commonality in that regard but there's not sorry it's law we're used it to is. it yeah which is sometimes there's no right or wrong answer so that helps too all right well thank you very much for your attendance this evening um all the best with your assessment work and we'll see you all next week for perpetuities bye then <laughs>